The subject tonight is the fandom of the opera, how the audience for a four-century-old art form helped create the modern media world. Uh, this, by the way, you may have noticed in Sunday's New York Times magazine, the cover story was about the Metropolitan Opera's head, Peter Gelb. And here's my favorite line from that story. This, after all, is opera, opera in New York, not some dainty pastime like professional hockey. So what's in a word? Um, you're certainly familiar with soap operas. And if you ask somebody, why are they called soap operas, they'll say, well, it's because uh, Procter & Gamble or other soap companies would sponsor them. Well, that explains the soap part, but what about the opera part? Nobody sings in a soap opera, and westerns were called horse operas since 1927. Um, science fiction stuff was called either space opera or time opera. So why opera? No one's singing. Well, it's because they're all melodramatic. And the word melodrama was the original word for opera. The drama part is theater, and mellow is from the same root as melody. It's musical. So opera is a form of musical theater. But how do we go from melodrama, meaning opera, to meaning extravagant theatricality? Well, what is opera? And the simple answer is, I don't know. I cannot for the life of me figure out why Carmen is an opera and West Side Story is not. In neither one do they sing all the way through. They've got similar kinds of stories and so on. But I can tell you about the word. In Latin, the word opus means work. And opera is the plural of opus, so it means works, because opera combines singing and instrumental music and storytelling, acting, visual arts, stagecraft, dancing, nudity and erotica sometimes, uh, but sex almost always. Samuel Johnson called it um, exotic and irrational entertainment. Now, doing all that means it's expensive, and I'll explain a little bit later when I get to the Met. There's 3,400 people on the Metropolitan Opera payroll. The first opera house opened in 1637. Before that, it was a plaything for the rich, like jousting or something like that. It was something they would do at a party. didn't matter how much it cost. But once they opened a commercial opera house, they had to pay for it. So they introduced three innovations. One had nothing to do with paying for it. That was putting the musicians in front of the stage. But the other two was having boxes for the rich people who could pay a lot of money for their box to see and be seen, and having a very large auditorium. Well, if you have a very large auditorium, then you have very large gestures, so you can be seen at any place in the opera house. Well, that's where operatic or melodramatic came to be synonymous with over-the-top gestures, and that's why soap opera is soap opera. Now, it's a very large institution. On the upper right, you can see the interior of what used to be known as the Paris Opera House. Now it's the Palais Garnier. Uh, they do mostly ballet there, but it's a fairly large auditorium. But if you look at the large picture, it's just that little tiny thing in the center. The rest of that building is still necessary to do opera. There's shops, there's lobbies, there's all kinds of other stuff. There's even a lake. The lake from the Phantom of the Opera was a fire extinguishing tool for the Paris Opera. So when you have a giant institution and it has stars and it has stories, if you're coming up with a new media technology, you go to that institution to try it out. Now here's a completely different question. Why is Galileo called Galileo? We know Galileo is Galileo, but it's Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, Nicholas Copernicus, Edmund Halley, Claudius Ptolemy, Christian Huygens, even his fellow countryman, Giovanni Cassini. We use the last name for all of those, but for Galileo, we say Galileo. When we talk about Newton, we don't say, well, you know, Isaac was doing this. So why is he called Galileo? It's because there was already a famous Galilei, his father, Vincenzo. His father named him Galileo, by the way, because he thought it was a mellifluous sounding name, Galileo Galilei. Uh, Vincenzo Galilei is sometimes considered the father of opera. He came up with the idea of doing something called recitative, which is sort of a singing recitation. Uh, he's also the father of modern acoustics. He came up with the equations for tuning strings and pipes. Um, and he taught Galileo to experiment and said, don't trust anyone's authority. We'll come back to him a little bit later. But opera was spectacular from the very start. Here is a 
stage design for an opera in Florence in 1637, the very first year that there was commercial opera. And you can see there's flying creatures and there's horses on stage and flames coming out and all that. Well, you know, is this just the stage designer's um, imagination run wild and they would never have this on the stage? No, they actually did. Here is a handbook of opera stagecraft that was published in 1638. It tells you how to make waves and clouds and thunder and lightning and flames and flying and how to do a spotlight in the 17th century and a lighting dimmer. On the right you can see an image of the lighting dimmer that he described, a way of dimming the light from candles and how to do scene changes. Now notice the capstan at the bottom of this cloud machine on the left. You'll see another capstan momentarily. This is an opera house that opened in 1766 just outside of Stockholm called the Drottningholm Slottstheater or the Drottningholm Court Theater. And it was done as sort of a, a play thing for the queen, Queen Ulrika. Um, there's nothing fancy in it. All the things that look like they're gold are actually paper mache with yellow paint on it. Um, but the stage machinery was designed by one of the greatest opera architects of the time. So here's part of it. Uh, you can see a thunder box above the stage. That's a giant coffin-like box that has um, rocks in it. And you pull the strings and the box comes down and you hear <laughs> of the rocks going by. And then to the left of the stage, you can see a wind machine. Here is the machinery for moving the wing flats and see the capstan in the basement for doing that, all human powered. Here is the machinery for the flies. They can do, by the way, a complete set change from, say, a park to a palace in four seconds using nothing but this human-operated machinery. And they have a waiting list of people who want to be stagehands. Here's flying. You can have Cupid flying around or a god or something like that. Um, here's one of the elevators and traps, and you'll see that in operation. That's the elevator motor with the handles on it down at the basement. Here's ocean waves, and there's uh, five different handles. You'll see this at the very beginning, so keep your eyes peeled or you might miss it. And there's a ship that goes by in the ocean waves. And here's the lighting system. Now, this is the only concession they made to the modern age. Uh, in the old days, it was all candle lighting. Sweden is in the European Union. They're not going to have a wooden building with thousands of candles in it. So they put in a very elaborate fiber optic system that delivers the light of one candle to each location where there used to be a candle. And here it is in operation. That's just to give you a quick idea of what opera was like even in the 18th century. Um, here's another 18th century opera house. This is the Hamburg Opera in 1726, and the production that you see on the right side is 
Giulio Cesare, which is going to be um, one of the Metropolitan Opera Cinema casts in April, and it has moving image projection in 1726. The projector is what you see on the left. It was lit by oil lamps, and the motion came from a slide that went in that was operated mechanically, but you can see the illustration of fireworks there. They had a slide that would show fireworks going off, and they could do all kinds of other slides. And the City of London, which is projected in the background there, was also a slide projection. Now here's the first operatic medium for going beyond the house. Um, books and little books. Little books are known in Italian as libretti. Uh, at the left, we have the oldest known libretto uh, from the year 1598. And this is when some people say the first opera was. It was called Daphne in Florence. And it was given out as a gift by the rich person. And so you see he used absolutely wonderful, fine paper, no see-through or anything like that. You can touch this, by the way, at the Library for the Performing Arts up at Lincoln Center. They have a copy. Yes? If the first opera house was in 1637, uh -huh. why is there a libretto in 1598? Uh, opera goes back perhaps even to the 12th century, um, but it was performed in rich people's houses. It wasn't performed so in an opera house. Way. Yeah, a chamber, a courtyard, whatever. There were some fantastic ceremonies for the Medici wedding in 1589, and I can't tell why that's not considered opera, but some people don't consider that opera, and the other stuff was. Same people who wrote that wrote this first opera, Daphne. But by 1600, people liked the idea of this libretto so much that um, the same guy who printed it up offered it for sale, but now that he was selling it, he went to cheap paper, so it's see-through and... Uh, not so great. Now on the right, we have the first two-language libretto. Handel had this great scam that he operated in London. Uh, it's an English-speaking country. He performs Italian opera. How are you going to tell what the people are singing? You buy a libretto. How are you going to read the libretto? You buy a candle. So Handel was selling candles as well as libretti uh, and made a substantial amount of his income from that. A little bit more about illumination. Now, I've mentioned candles, and when I say candle, you think of the candles that we have today. Candles prior to the middle of the 19th century were nothing like the candles we have today. They were stinky, they were smoky, um, they melted if you just touched them, um, they were sometimes toxic. There are reports of birds dropping dead from the smoke that came off of a candle. Marie Antoinette complained about this stuff. Some of the opera houses were so smoky that you couldn't see the people on the stage from the candles. And most important, the wicks didn't burn down as they do today. So the wick would just keep getting bigger and bigger, and the flames would get bigger and bigger. And so the people on stage had to trim the wicks. So they had these fancy scissors called snuffers, and they would go around and they would trim the wicks. That changed quickly to modern candles in the middle of the 19th century, as well as gas, and then electricity. But where was the first electricity used in an opera house? Uh, in anywhere, it was 1849 at the Paris Opera by Jules Dubost, who did a uh, sunrise effect in the opera Le Prophète, and then he later did rainbows and spouting fountains and all kinds of other stuff. Now, it's one thing that he came up with an electric light using an, an electric arc, but another, he needed electric power. There was no power company. So he came up with batteries, but the batteries in those days were also toxic. So he came up with a way of making the batteries non-toxic, and uh, Nature magazine applauded him for that. By the way, he also patented the world's first motion picture system in 1852, and it was 3D. Here's a little bit more on flame-based lighting, even when it was gas and so on. They consumed oxygen, one candle used as much oxygen as two people. They generated carbon dioxide so much that they made breathing difficult. They generated heat. At the same time, they caused cold drafts because the heat had to be vented, so the cold air got sucked in. So on this slide, you see down at the bottom, on the street outside the theater, it was 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside the opera house, it was 121. <laughs> and of course, it set things on fire also. Um, so the first fire codes, the first fire extinguishers, and the first fire departments were developed by opera houses. The Vienna Court Opera had a 21-man fire watch uh, with people who could put out fires and could deal with stuff, as I mentioned, the lake at the Paris Opera and so on. 
Now here's another interesting tidbit related to opera houses and lighting. I have it on my shirt, no opera, no x-rays. Um, the first opera house with incandescent lighting was in 1881, that was in London, and it was followed very soon by opera houses in Boston, Brno, and Paris. Now Edison didn't make his first power plant until 1882. So how did the opera houses run their lights? They put in their own generators. Now in 1895, uh, Rentkin comes up with the uh, first description of x-rays, and by 1896, there's a guy in Boston, Dr. Ernest Codman, who's already been qualified in a court as an expert in x-rays. He was the first skiographer, as radiologists were called in those days, at Boston Children's Hospital, which had the first pediatric x-ray department. But there was no power company in Boston, and the hospital was lit by candles. So how did they run the x-ray machine? They ran a line over to the opera house because the opera house had generators. But when do the opera house generators run? Only when there's an opera. No opera, no x-rays. Okay, now let's get to traditional media history. 1876, Bell files a patent for the telephone. That's his telephone at the upper right. 1879, Edison comes up with his light bulb. 1895, the first movie theater with the Lumieres. 1920, the first commercial radio station. 1927, the first sound movie, The Jazz Singer. 1939, TV is introduced at the New York World's Fair. 1961, the first FM stereo broadcast. Right, you're all familiar with some of that. Now let's put opera into the picture. In every case, opera beats the tradition. So, yeah, Bell filed a patent for the telephone in 1876. Antonio Meucci was working on telephones at Havana Opera in 1849. Uh, 1879, Edison comes up with the light bulb. 1849, as I mentioned, at the Paris Opera, electric lighting already. 1895, first movie theater. 1886, the first movie system developed for opera. Uh, 1920, first commercial radio station. The first complete operas were broadcast in 1910. 1927, first sound movie. There were opera sound movies in 1900 that people went to the theater to see specifically, and there was a demonstration of an opera sound movie even before that. TV introduced at the World's Fair in 1939. Well, there was an opera on TV in 1934. And another one that was on TV in 1936 that was on TV before it opened in the Opera House. First stereo broadcast, 1961. Berlin Opera was doing stereo radio in 1925. So let's look at some of these in detail. Again, 1637, the first opera house. In 1673, Athanasius Kircher comes up with an idea for the first plaza cast. Let's get the sound out of the opera house to the plaza in front so people can hear the opera using acoustic ducts. And all of the opera houses, because they were these big theaters, people were worried about the acoustics, they used some form of piping or ducts to distribute the sound starting in the 17th century. Then we get to the prediction of other opera media. There was a famous physicist in Britain, Charles Wheatstone, also the inventor of the concertina. Um, he came up with these concerts that he called telephone concerts, and he would have the musicians playing on the floor above the audience, and he would have a very fine line of bronze wire that was attached to the soundboard of the piano or harpsichord or harp or wherever it was, going down to this fake, obviously very fake, lyre that he had hanging from the uh, wire. But the sound would be conducted down the wire and would emanate from the lyre, and people would think it was an enchanted lyre. He uh, encouraged them to think this, he would pretend to wind it up or something like that. And when the press came, a guy from Repository Arts said, uh, who knows, but by these means, the music of the opera performed at the King's Theatre may ere long be simultaneously enjoyed at Hanover Square Rooms, the City of London Tavern, and even at the Horns Tavern in Kennington. So here again we have Antonio Meucci. The, um, he has a museum, by the way, in Staten Island where you can see his early telephone stuff. He moved there from Havana. There's a stamp that the Italian government uh, made for him. There was a resolution introduced in the House of Representatives that passed by a Staten Island congressperson saying uh, Meucci invented the telephone. Um, in 1848, Punch had a story saying, well, yeah, you know, we're going to deliver opera sounds via some form of telephonic means, and it'll be for a fee, so it's a business. The New York Times in 1876 predicted that there would be a box office drop at the opera house, because who wants to go to the hot and crowded opera house uh, when you can have it delivered to your home by telephone? 
Then here's another punch cartoon with the mistress of the house instructing someone uh, which operas to deliver at what time. In um, also in 1877, uh, Alexander Graham Bell did a demonstration where a singer in Providence sung an aria that was heard in Boston over telephone lines. In 1878, the entire opera Don Pasquale was done in Bellinzona, Switzerland. Uh, by 1880, it was transmitted from Zurich to Basel, uh, an 80-kilometer distance. A microphone was invented just for opera. And we have the first courtesy home listeners. This is the invention of electronic home entertainment. Here, by the way, is that New York Times article uh, saying who's going to go to the hot and crowded building when you can get it delivered by telephone. So the two first home listeners, I can't say with absolute certainty which one was first, although I strongly suspect it was Edward Fry. He uh, had been an opera impresario. He lived very close to here, about a couple of blocks from this cafe. He had the phone company install a telephone connection to the Academy of Music, which was the main opera house in New York at the time. And he arranged photos of the singers around himself, and he had a libretto in his hand, and he listened to the opera. Well, he's an invalid. He can't go to the opera house. He's got these photos arranged around himself. He's holding the libretto. How is he listening to the opera? Is he doing this while he's got the libretto and he's turning pages with his pinky? No. My lovely wife, Karen, here, comes up with the brilliant idea, which is he probably invented headphones as well as electronic home entertainment. But whether he did it or not, unquestionably consumer headphones were invented for opera, as I'll show you in a moment. And then the other suspect is William Hurden in Plymouth, England, who connected to the Theatre Royal exactly the same way. Well, what Fry did was publicized in many newspapers. I found something in a New Zealand newspaper talking about Fry at the time. So an aviation pioneer at the world's first electricity exposition in 1881 says, let's do this, but I want to add another element. I want to do it in stereo. Now, nobody had come up with the term stereophonic yet, although he said it was similar to the 3D viewers, which were called stereoscopes. Uh, he called it binauricular audition. But he had these pairs of microphones at the Paris Opera stage. They went about two miles to the electricity exhibition, and you can see the people all listening with their uh, two things, and they thought it was remarkable. Victor Hugo was one of the listeners, and he said, it's very strange. We heard opera coming through two earpieces connected to the wall. The children were delighted, and me too. So opera started to promote telephones. Um, here at the top is a portion of the 1883 telephone book for Dundee, Scotland. And you can see that if you wanted to buy tickets to the opera, you would ask the operator to connect you to 171. But if you wanted to listen to the opera, you had the opera co operator connect you to 172. And you got to hear the opera. And here is something from um, the engineer of that phone company say, oh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and people have listened to it 20 miles away from the Opera House. Now, here we have something strange that occurred in Lisbon, Portugal in 1884. The king at that time was Don Luis on the left. Uh, there's the Opera House, Teatro de San Carlos. And there was a Portuguese-born opera composer by the name of Augusto Machado. And he had written an opera called Lorian, which he premiered in France because, frankly, Lisbon was not the center of the opera universe. But it was a big hit in France. And so he was bringing it back to Lisbon. And the king says, absolutely, I am going to listen to this. It's front page news in all the papers. And then the king's sister, Princess Maria Anna of Saxony, drops dead. Well, the rules of royal mourning are the king's not allowed to leave the palace. So what to do? Well, before I get to that, just notice the look of the opera house. Remember when there was that talk about faster than light neutrinos? This is the project, and looks just like that opera house. Uh, they called it the opera project, even though it had nothing to do with opera. It didn't look like the opera house, and they really had to force it. It was the oscillation project with emulsion to racking apparatus. Okay, so an engineer who remembered what happened in Paris in 1881 said, I can do the same thing. And he rigs up microphones. Those things that look like HDTVs in the picture there are actually telephone transmitters. He puts them on the stage and transmits to the palace. 
Um, this is from a Portuguese publication in 1884. The king listens. The thing he's actually listening with is on the right, which is maybe the first earbuds. Um, the king hears the opera. Honor is satisfied. Um, the uh, protocol of mourning is satisfied. Everybody is happy. And so some theatrical promoters go, this is a good idea. Let's turn this into a business. So the next year, they offer all 90 operas from Teatro de San Carlos for 180,000 reis, which works out to about 1,800 bucks in today's money. So 20 bucks an opera, not too terrible. It's a joint venture of the theatrical promoters and the local telephone company. Now, at the same year in Madrid, there were only 80 telephones in the entire city of Madrid. They still said, we got to put this in. This is important. We have to deliver opera by telephone. And because people don't have telephones, let's also have halls that people can go to so they can listen to the opera over the telephone. P.T. Barnum, who dabbled in opera, he brought Jenny Lynn, the famous Swedish soprano, uh, to New York to perform. He wanted to bring performances from the Paris Opera to New York over telephone lines, transatlantic cable. Um, now, the electrician and electrical engineer could have criticized it on any number of bases. They could have said it's going to sound terrible after it crosses the Atlantic. They could have said it's ridiculously expensive. He wanted $5 an act, which in today's money would be about $120 per act. So ridiculous. But instead they say, oh, performances at the Paris Opera depend largely for their success on the scenery and ballet. The singer is not ranking very high. By 1888, the same publication says, oh, by the way, all these people who are listening to opera over the telephone, they're listening on headphones. So we know no later than 1888, opera invented headphones, but it might have been as early as 1880. Um, there were stereo headphones in the UK by 1895, a service that they had called the Electrophone. What did people do before at headphones? They had elbow rests. So what were the different business plans? Well, in Dundee, Scotland, it was just the call charges from the telephone company. In Lisbon, there was the annual subscription. In Paris, there were two different business plans. There was a coin-op system for their theatrophone, and you see the woman in the uh, yellow dress dealing with that. Same woman on the bottom left is dealing with that. You put in your 10 centime coin, and you got three minutes of opera, and a little needle told you which opera you were listening to. Uh, there was also a Paris residential service, and it was per event. You paid an annual fee for the lines, and then you called up the op operator and said, connect me to the Palais Garnier, and you listened to the opera from there and paid for it. Marcel Proust was a subscriber, and he discovered the opera Peleas and Melisande at home in bed over his theatrophone. Uh, the fancy-looking thing that you see down at the bottom is uh, Marcel Proust's system. Now, in Budapest, the guy who put in the system came up with a different business plan. He wanted a monthly charge, just like your cable bill. Say, so, okay, I'm going to have pay cable in Budapest. The guy who's sitting there at the right, uh, that's somebody, one of the Budapest subscribers, and you can see very clearly he's wearing headphones. So he puts in his system, and he gets a few thousand subscribers, and it's okay, it's not bad, but he wants to make more money. And he goes, hmm, the opera doesn't start until 8 o'clock at night, but I've got the lines going to the houses all day long. What can I do to get more subscribers? I know an opera invents the newscast. He hires six people called stentors to read the news into telephone transmitter. Uh, by the way, the connection between news and opera houses goes farther back than that. In 1853, if you went to the Royal Italian Opera House in London on the Haymarket, you could get telegraphic news from Parliament delivered directly to your box. Now, some people say, oh, well, this was really a telephone news service and the opera was incidental. So I've included a poster for the service on the right. I don't know how your Hungarian is, but it basically says you can get the opera or you can get light opera or you can listen to the news. Opera was also responsible for the invention of broadcast rights. Now, early opera composers made a bunch of money, but they made it only on commissions because copyright was never enforced up until about the middle of the 19th century. But Giuseppe Verdi started writing around the middle of the 19th century, and he enforced his copyright very strongly. So he didn't really like writing operas. In 1840, he wrote 14 operas, and the 1850s, seven operas, in the 1860s, two operas, and from the 1870s to the 1890s, he wrote only one opera per decade. 
because he was making money on royalties for all his other operas. Notice a resemblance, by the way, between Giuseppe Verdi and Mr. Moneybags. Um, now, in Brussels, in 1899, there's a theatrophone service that somebody wants to show off. So there's an electricity exhibition. They want to show off their service. So they connect lines to the Societe de Concert, where someone is going to sing La Donna e Mobile from Giuseppe Verdi's opera Rigoletto. Uh, and Verdi gets wind of this. Now, they paid. They paid the fee for performing the song in the opera house. But Verdi said, uh-uh, you didn't pay for the telephone distribution. So he files a lawsuit. The judge says, you're absolutely right. You guys are not allowed to transmit anything by telephone without Verdi's permission, and you've got to pay him. Invention of Broadcast Rights, 1899. Now, the phonograph was very different from the telephone. The telephone, even before it started, you know, back in 1821, they said, oh, this is going to be a way to transmit opera. But for the phonograph, they said, oh, yeah, you know, you can store sermons. Uh, Edison wrote an article about the phonograph, and he said, well, the main utility of the phonograph is um, going to be for letter writing. Why not for opera? Well, um, it's too, not live and too short. So Edison's cylinder would record only two minutes. The uh, Berliner discs would record only two minutes. That was later extended to four minutes. Um, there was, however, an aria that was recorded in 1860, not played back until 2009, because it was recorded on a system never intended to be played back. This is 17 years before Edison's first phonograph. But at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, they came up with the technology to be able to play back that piece of paper called the phonograph strip. Uh, the earliest surviving opera recordings we have are from 1889, but the first aria that was sung was 1878. There was playback even earlier, however. This is something that was at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art recently. That's an automaton that was given to Marie Antoinette, and it played music from two operas by Gluck. Now that's 1784. Uh, there were many systems. Some had multiple instruments. There was a clock, the thing you see on the right, played music from uh, two operas by Handel, and that was in 1738. The earliest device I found that played opera music, uh, 1733. But there's no reason it could have been earlier than couldn't have been earlier than that. You can see a 1625 clock that had both an organ and a spinet in it. Uh, by the way, people talk about the Jacquard loom as being the first programmable device. Uh, here you see a programmable barrel for one of these systems from 1480, way, way before the Jacquard loom. But these were rich people's things. So that was given to Marie Antoinette. She was freaked out because it looked like her. So she gave it to the French Academy of Sciences, which is why we have it today. Um, if it, she had owned it, then probably would have been burned. But what about the masses? The masses couldn't afford this kind of stuff. You couldn't say, oh, I'd love to have that automaton playing opera in my living room. But they could afford this. So the first gramophone disc was created in 1888, three years before people were already listening to opera music on discs. Uh, the discs were made right here in New York. Uh, Jersey City was the factory. They were mass produced. In England, they went for a few pence. I've seen uh, U.S. catalogs where they would cost maybe 20 cents or something like that. There were disc changers. There were coin-operated systems. So the first jukeboxes played opera music. And uh, there were also organ grinders. And the New York Mirror in 1845 said um, that songs from the Bohemian Girl were already established favorites ground by every hand organ. Here's a Penny Arcade in 1889 where you could go to listen to an Edison cylinder and uh, listen to music on that, but it's not visual, 
It's only a short time, it's not live, and there's distortions not only from the recording horn but also from the playback tube. So, uh, oh, this, by the way, is the Metropolitan Opera's uh, librarian, Lionel Mapleson. He did the first non-interfering reco um, location recordings, and he did those at the Met starting in 1900. One solution to the lack of visuals, this was suggested by a gramophone magazine, have um, a model stage and puppets. And in May, I'm going to a puppet opera in Chicago that actually dates back to the 1930s. So if records are so unfriendly, how do we get to this point where the cover of Punch magazine talks about the opera season of 1908 with stars in opposition or the record operatic duel between Tetrasini and uh, Melba? Well, it's because of this company called Victor. The reason the company is called Victor is that they were sued. They are the successor to Emil Berliner's disk system. They were sued by all their competitors to slow them down. Um, so they decided, after they won all their lawsuits, that they would call themselves Victor. But by this point, Edison had about an 11-year head start on them. They were never going to bust into Edison's market. Edison was selling cylinders, remember, so their disks were incompatible. How do they get people to buy their system? They decided to tie their fortunes to opera. At the right is what was the world's largest illuminated sign at the time. You can see somebody changing the bulbs up there. It was on Broadway and 36th Street near the Metropolitan Opera. And they say, if you buy one of our phonographs, we deliver the opera to you at home, and you become part of the opera class. So people would buy the phonograph. They'd buy maybe one opera record, like that one that I show on the uh, upper left. That's um, Enrico Caruso singing Vesti La Juba, which was the earliest recorded million seller. It wasn't the first million seller. The first million seller was a country and western song um, called The Wreck of Old 97 by a singer by the name of Vernon Dalhart. But it turns out that Vernon Dalhart had been trained in opera and was an opera singer before he became a country and western singer. Um, but Caruso's recording has never been out of print. So people would buy the um, machine, they would buy maybe one opera record, and they'd buy country music or whatever they wanted to listen on it, but by having the machine and the one record, they were part of the opera at home. There was also a book that they came up with, and they won. Uh, that's how they got a substantial portion of the market. So Edison decides, okay, I have to go to discs also. So he introduces something called diamond discs, but he has to say, my diamond discs are so great, you can't even tell them from the real thing. So he would do these demonstrations where people would be either blindfolded um, and be asked to tell whether they were listening to a phonograph or listening to a real singer, or he would do something like in Carnegie Hall and turn out the lights. And so here we have something that was in the Pittsburgh Post. Did not seem difficult to determine in the dark when the singer sang and when she did not. The writer himself was pretty sure about it until the lights were turned on again, and it was discovered that the singer was not on the stage at all, and that the new Edison alone had been heard. And today we go, this is ridiculous. How could they not tell the difference between a mechanical record and a real person, but it was something new and perceptions are learned. Plus, we have this confession. At the right is a Metropolitan Opera singer, Anna Case, and uh, she confessed in 1972 that she trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording of herself. <laughs> now, uh, here we have that picture of Caruso singing into a horn, and that distorted his voice. So here we have Tom Stockham on the right, he was one of the people who investigated the Nixon 18 and a half minute Watergate recording gap. Um, brilliant signal processing guy. So he decided to use something called blind deconvolution to figure out what Caruso would really have sounded like. And in 1976, he came out with a record with Caruso's real voice with, without the sound of the horn on it. He also came up with this digital audio recording system and issued the first commercial digital recording in 1976. What was it? An opera, the mother of us all from Santa Fe. Here are the oldest movies, uh, they were, or oldest existing movies. Uh, they were shot by Louis Le Prince, and he took it to the uh, secretary of the Paris Opera to certify them, and the secretary certified it as method and apparatus for the projection of animated pictures in view of adaptation to an operatic scenes. Uh, patent in 1886, issued in 1888. 
Here's Thomas Edison's first filing with the U.S. Patent Office in 1888 uh, for motion pictures. And what does he say is the purpose of motion pictures? Opera, only opera. We may see and hear a whole opera as perfectly as, that, as if actually present, and it can record a continuous opera and so on. He, by the way, proposed a, an opera color TV system in 1891, but he never achieved it. So here's the silent era. Um, individual, not live, no sound, very brief. Here's a, a film called Carmen Sita. But was it really silent, or was there sound? If I do something from the habanera of Carmen, it seems to make much more sense. Uh, so it could be that that recording was made with the intention of being heard with sound. Now, what did people do for early operas? Well, they wanted to have stars, so they hired opera stars. There's Geraldine Farrar, who was an opera star at the lower right, performing in what story? Carmen, because that was something that people knew as a story. So they would use opera stories, and they would use opera singers. Uh, the opera Martha was recorded here in New York in 1898, and was projected in 1899 with the singer standing behind the screen. The first movie score was written by the opera composer Camille Saint-Saëns in 1908. And then in 1915, we have this strange thing, Rhapsodia Satanica, written by uh, Pietro Mascagni, and it's called the first film opera. Now, what does what makes it the first film opera? It wasn't the first opera on film. It wasn't the first film, uh, but it's got a libretto. And the libretto was written by a poet and it has pictures from the movie in it, so I guess they intended it to be a film opera. Here are some other techniques that were used before the sound era um, for cueing the musicians in the movie theater. Here you see cue lights in the set, that rhomboid up at the top. They would light up to indicate who was supposed to start singing now. Um, in this one, down at the bottom, you see a little image of a conductor. Uh, that was to conduct the singers in the movie theater so they could see what was going on. And this is the most complex system down at the bottom there. It's the musical score which moved across the bottom of the screen backwards with an arrow to show where they were at the moment. The reason it was backwards was the singers were standing behind the screen so they could see it and be able to sing. Now here is uh, an intertitle from a movie. Anyone have any idea uh, what movie this is? Pretty famous movie. It's the jazz singer. People think of the jazz singer as the first all singing, all talking movie, but in fact, huge portions of it were silent. But it did have some sound, so we talk about that as being the first sync sound movie. Except, here's a poster for sync sound movies in 1905 in the middle, and a poster for sync sound movies in 1900 on the left, and that was only one of three places you could go at the Paris World's Fair of 1900 to listen to sync sound movies of opera arias. So why didn't sync sound continue? Well, here's the oldest existing sync sound movie. The guy who was playing the violin was William Dixon, who worked for Thomas Edison and invented many of his movie things. He's playing music from an opera um, that came out recently, but you heard what it sounded like. Now, which would you rather hear, that tinny and very low, because there was no electronic amplification yet, or live singers? Wouldn't you like to have the live singers and the live musicians in your movie theater? And that's why there were no sound movies as a, on a regular basis until after amplification was developed and uh, after proper recording systems were developed. The first electronic microphone for recording was used in 1925, Jazz Singer 1927, not that much later after that. Here is the Milli Vanilli of opera. This is the first lip syncing intentionally. could go on with that for a long time. But I like how he drinks the water beforehand like a ventriloquist. Um, that was Caruso's voice. 
the guy, just some unknown actor who was hired to promote a movie sound system. Here's Cinerama, opened in New York in 1952. What's in the first movie? This is Cinerama. Aida from La Scala. Broadcasting. The first opera broadcast was actually acoustic before radio in 1900, again at the Paris World's Fair. Um, another aviation pioneer, Horace Short, who had the first airplane factory and who invented the folding wing design used on aircraft carriers, he comes up with this thing called an Ozzetto gramophone, where the needle on a record will control a valve that allows compressed air through or not. Takes it to Gustav Eiffel's office at the top of the Eiffel Tower, plays opera records, people can hear him for a quarter mile around the Eiffel Tower. Radio restores the event nature of opera and the length. Um, by the way, the first broadcast of either a live opera singer or opera music was in 1907 via a 200 ton synthesizer the first music synthesizer that was here in New York. It was called the Telharmonium, and it ha had its own uh, hall. It was called Telharmonium Hall, and it was across from the Metropolitan Opera House. By 1910, we have uh, operas being transmitted. By 1919, opera is transmitted 2,000 miles. Now, who would want to transmit opera 2,000 miles? The U.S. Navy, because they want to prove that their radio telephone systems work. The main Navy communications center is down in New Brunswick, New Jersey, so they run lines over to the New Brunswick Opera House, and that's how they test their systems. First stereo broadcast, as I mentioned, 1925. 1932, NBC uh, starts commissioning operas for radio broadcast. In 1937, they commission a non-visual opera. Actually, the CBS commissioned it. Um, used sound effects so it couldn't be performed on a stage. The first edited broadcast ever was in opera in 1938 here, WQXR. The first scheduled FM broadcast included Francesca de Rimini in opera. Uh, the first stereo network in the world was the Metropolitan Opera's stereo network and the first, stereo, the first satellite channel devoted to opera was in 2007. By the way, um, the Met did opera broadcasts in 1910, so Hammerstein builds a new opera house in London in 1911, and he says, it's going to have a radio station in it. And everybody goes, ooh, cool, you know, are you going to transmit operas? No, it's for selling tickets to people on ships at sea. Uh, that, by the way, is Nellie Melba in the middle. She's doing her radio broadcast. I like how she's holding on to her pocketbook. They originally didn't want her to be in the workshop. They wanted her to be in the front office, so they ran a line in, but the transmitter was so powerful that the microphone exploded and the line set the carpet on fire, so she went into the workshop. Here's the first prediction of opera on TV in 1882, at least home TV. Uh, this is a wonderful book called The 20th Century. It's been translated into English now by Albert Robida. And Mr. Ponto, the banker, listens to or watches opera on the telephonoscope, which he treats himself daily after dinner to aid with his digestion. The same book, by the way, predicts uh, not only TV, but also broadcasting, newscasts, product placement, and broadcast scripts, all based on the 1881 Paris Opera demonstrations. Now, here's science fiction. That's a picture from Robita's book, another picture of... Um, the telephonoscope being used at the opera. Science fact, there's a book published in Portugal in 1880 about la telescopia electrique, or television. Here's a book published in 1925 by Charles Francis Jenkins, who founded the Society of Motion Picture Engineers, currently SIMTI. And he's talking about his television receiver and um, why is it the way it is? Well, the casing enclosing the mechanism, not very large, and contains, besides the radio vision mechanism, the radio receiving set and a loudspeaker so that an entire opera in both action and music may be received. That's the purpose of television, opera. Uh, 1928, Fritz Reiner, the conductor, came up with the idea of a conductor camera a camera that would shoot him and people off stage could uh, see a conductor monitor. The first opera broadcast again on television, Carmen in 1934, first full-length opera in 1937, first lip-synced opera was Hansel and Gretel. They had kids as the actors, but they had adult opera singers singing it. There was a dance-sync version of Tristan in 1938, first opera live from an opera house stage in 1947, and then just like the radio opera that was unstageable because um, it used sound effects, Labyrinth was an opera written by Giancarlo Minotti and was broadcast on television in 1963, but it used video effects, so it couldn't be staged. 
the first opera just on cable TV, 1971, here in the city, uh, the first with live stereo and subtitles in 1976. By the way, that was the world's first live subtitles. Um, and then in 1989, the first in HDTV, the Bavarian Ring. HDTV wasn't broadcast in the United States until 1996. Now, it's kind of a good thing that the conductor camera didn't get built in 1928 because television cameras were extremely insensitive. The thing you see in the background behind the guy is a television camera, and those round circles all around that look like speakers, they're actually photocells. The light beam came out of the camera, hit stuff, and then bounced off the people and was picked up by the photocells. So it was kind of backwards. You did your lighting by adjusting the photocells, not by adjusting the lights. But that meant that the studio had to be pitch black. Well, if the studio's pitch black, how do you read the music? No problem, you print them in radium on black paper. Here's the US commercial TV opera era. ABC commissioned three operas. Uh, CBS commissioned 14 operas. NBC commissioned 13 operas. This is not even counting other operas that they were broadcasting. So here I have a list, four operas by Latterman and for each by Latterman and Minotti, two by Castle and Martineau, one by Stravinsky, one by Lucas Foss, David Amram. These are all operas that wouldn't exist if they hadn't been commissioned by commercial U.S. television networks here in New York. And there were also two TV stations. There was a local station in Louisville, Kentucky, that built a new studio, so they commissioned an opera for the occasion. Color television. People talk about the first color television broadcast being the Rose Parade on January 1st, 1954. But on October 31st, 1953, Carmen was transmitted from the Colonial Theater on Broadway at 62nd Street uh, in color to a home. The home was the home of Jack Gould, who was the New York Times TV critic at the time. And even before that, the quote unquote first publicly announced experimental broadcasting compatible color TV of a network program uh, NBC took Kukla, Fran, and Ali out of Chicago, brought them to the Colonial Theater in New York so they could do the operetta St. George and the Dragon. Opera going to a global audience, there was something called Tosca in the Settings and Times of Tosca that was aired in 1992. It was done in the location where each act of the opera was done. Um, it required in-ear speakers. It went live to 107 countries, 27 cameras involved. And here's a review on Amazon.com. I saw this live when it was televised around the world. I was living in Australia then and had to wake up at 4 a.m. to watch the second act. But so successful that they did La Traviata to 125 countries in 2000. Now, satellites have been delivering opera um, since 1976 in the geostationary orbit and since 1967 in the non-geostationary orbit. The orbit was proposed by Arthur C. Clarke in 1945 and the basis was Kepler's third law of planetary motion in 1919, which said that you could have a geosynchronous orbit. Well, um, Kepler turns out to have been the son of a witch, at least legally. His mother was accused of witchcraft. Now, before that, he published his first two laws of planetary motion by 1609, going on strong. But his mother gets accused that he was a lawyer as well as an astronomer, so he goes to defend her uh, unsuccessfully. And it's a long journey from Prague to where he has to defend her, so he asks a friend, what book should I take to read along the way? And the friend says, oh, this is a good book. Why don't you read this? He goes, okay. And as soon as he finishes the lawsuit, he works up his third law of planetary motion and publishes it in 1619. What was the book? It was Vincenzo Galilei's book about opera that was published in 1589, 1581, sorry. Um, and there's Kepler's book on the left, The Harmony of the World, which also includes, by the way, for the first time, the phrase, the music of the spheres. These are pictures that could have been from the movie Angels and Demons. That's Castel San Angelo on the left where the third act of Tosca takes place. And there's the Large Hadron Collider at CERN outside of Geneva. But they also have an opera connection. Again, Tosca in the settings and at the times of Tosca was shot there for the third act. 
and the Large Hadron Collider has the highest speed data lines anywhere, so they were used by the World Opera Project. Now, here's the World Opera Project. You can have singers anywhere in the world, and they can sing together, and you can have the orchestra anywhere in the world, and people can watch this anywhere in the world. But the problem is that even at the speed of light, the distance from, say, New York to Sydney, 16,000 uh, kilometers, would come to about 53 milliseconds of acoustic delay. So it would be like people singing 50 feet apart, which is not so great for a love duet. Um, so those faster than light neutrinos, that might be useful. How about community TV? Here's the first mention of what we today call alternative content for cinema. It was published in the New York Sun in 1877. This is even five years before Albert Roby does prediction of television to the home that uh, it should be possible to represent at one time on a hundred stages in various parts of the world the opera or play sung or acted in any given theater. Here's the first proposal for actually doing this. It's a semi-live cinema proposal. They say, shoot the opera on film, deliver the film to all the cinemas, have them all start the opera at the same time. The singers in New York will watch the opera on their screen. Notice they have a wide aspect ratio. Everyone else has a narrow aspect ratio. Uh, they'll sing live into the radio, and then people in the movie theaters will hear the sound live. Well, this was done in 1952. Here's a Metropolitan Opera transmitted to movie theaters, 31 cinemas in 27 cities, low definition, black and white, less than AM quality sound, uh, sold more than 60,000 seats at about a $60 ticket top, and it was rated very highly. Um, why was it rated very highly? Well, two reasons that I can think of. One, group mentality. If no one else complains, why should I complain? And that's why people applauded in the movie theaters. And that's why today people still applaud in the movie theaters. The other is cognitive dissonance. If you spend $60 on a ticket and devote the time to go to a movie theater and the effort to get there, and you don't like what's happening, then you're stupid. But you don't want to be stupid. So maybe it wasn't as bad as you thought. Free community TV was first done in uh, 1986 in Basel, Switzerland, because that was the headquarters of Siba Geige, and Siba Geige owned Gretag, which was the company that made the Ida 4 video projector that was used. The people in the plaza were seeing a color picture, by the way. This just happens to be a black and white picture shot of it. In 2006, the Met started delivering to the plaza at Lincoln Center and also to Times Square. There's a crowd. One year, there was a torrential downpour. People stayed there to watch it on the screens. And then starting in 2007, we have opera at the ballpark. Um, that's San Francisco Opera at AT&T Park. They're watching AIDA, 32,000 people in the ballpark. It's also done in uh, Washington, D.C. It's done in Washington State and a few other places. Now, since I'm mentioning uh, opera at the ballpark, maybe I should also mention that people used to go to opera houses to watch live remote baseball games starting in 1885 in Augusta and Nashville. Here's a story from Sporting Life on the right talking about the system. Uh, down at the bottom is a headline from the Atlanta Constitution in 1886 for the system in Atlanta. By 1886, it had already spread to Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, uh, Cincinnati, and Detroit. Within a few years, this was in every opera house in the country. The si uh, signals would come in by telegraph and people would get to um, learn what the play was. Somebody would announce them, and then there would be some kind of a board or um, a curtain or something. Eventually, there were robotic figures to show the plays. In Atlanta, they actually hired boys to run around a painted ball field on the stage and reproduce the plays. Now, there's a, an account of this in the 1886 Detroit Free Press, and it sounds just like a sportscast. So opera is also responsible for sportscast terminology and stuff like, and it's a high fly ball, and then, and, and it's out! That's all in the Detroit press, and then there's this thunderous applause that follows that. Uh, by 1891, electricity was added. 1894, there are androids. There's a report in the Richmond Times of a system there where some viewer says, why, they bow just as sweetly as real men when they're applauded. Uh, the system at the left was invented in New York by um, an actor 
who then brought it to the New York Opera Houses. The uh, system in the black there, that actually had 1,500 light bulbs that could show the arc of the ball. James Barry, the guy who wrote Peter Pan, was in New York once and was staying at the Knickerbocker Hotel in Times Square and asked to have his room changed so he could watch the baseball game on one of these systems on the face of the Times building. This lasted into the 1930s. At the right, you have an ad from the Arizona Daily Star, the daily newspaper in Tucson, uh, saying that that newspaper is sponsoring free viewing of the World Series at the Opera House. Opera in 3D, predicted in 1936. Philip Glass's opera, Monsters of Grace, premiered at Wolf Trap, and the sets were just so elaborate that it would be too expensive to build the sets, so instead they did a 3D movie. And you've all seen the pictures of the audience wearing the 3D glasses. Well, there's one of those at the right, except this audience maybe looks a little better dressed than the usual 3D audience. Um, they're at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles watching um, Philip Glass's Monsters of Grace with their 3D glasses on so they can see the set in 3D. Don Giovanni was transmitted from Opera de Rennes live in 3D in 2009, six months before Avatar opened. Uh, Faust was transmitted from the Folk Opera in um, Stockholm in 2010. Lucrezia Borgia was transmitted from the English National Opera in London in 2011. And then Carmen from the Royal Opera House was distributed. There's also cyberspace opera. Uh, an opera called Countdown that was considered the first computer-aided opera was available on the web in 1994. The web didn't exist until 1990. So this is pretty early in uh, web history. Honoria in Ciber Spazio was a collaborative opera, first performance in 1995. Then there's something called Vert Opera, kind of like the World Opera uh, Project, the Internet Opera, and so on. And finally, we have the future 100 years ago. This is a um, cartoon that appeared in Life magazine on December 7th, 1911. Uh, all the way at the far right, you have the first ebook reader. Uh, he's getting his light from the Metropolitan Light Company. He's getting his uh, air from the Ocean Breeze Company. He can keep track of his son with a spying system. But what is at the heart of it? It's those two big speakers, and they are delivering the opera delivered to your door. So that's the history section. Now let's move on. On December 30th, 2006, Metropolitan Opera sent the Magic Flute live in high definition to a small number of movie theaters in the US, Canada, England, and Norway, about 60. Now sends HD operas to more than 2,000 screens in more than 60 countries, plus art centers, schools, and 19 ships in international waters, all live. Um, if you can't read the language on the um, poster on the upper right, that's because it's from Estonia. Why should we care about this? Well, Los Angeles Times called it a new art form. Garrison Keillor called it a landmark triumph comparable to Caruso singing into a phonograph. It's a new TV programming outlet for various arts uh, institutions. It's a cinema audience draw. Um, when I went looking for something for the Cineplex chain in Canada, the first thing that popped up was this combined logo of the Metropolitan Opera and Cineplex, because Cineplex credits the Met single-handedly with saving it from bankruptcy. Here we have a car crash to the right of the Cineplex logo. That's in Connecticut. This SUV rolled over. The fire department came to rescue the people in the car, uh, dragged them out, uh, said, OK, the ambulance is right here. They said, no, 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 we have to go. I said, what do you mean you have to go? We don't want to miss the opera. Um, it's raised money and publicity for various opera companies. It's new contents, won an Emmy Award, even though it's not television, not supposed to be able to win an Emmy Award. It's won Peabody Award. Um, it's used for promotion of various opera companies and so on. So what is the Metropolitan Opera House? It was created in 1883 actually as a real estate company because there were people who wanted to be in the boxes at the Academy of Music, and they weren't allowed in. There weren't many boxes there, so they built their own opera house so they could have boxes. And they hired an opera company to perform operas. The first year, they hired an Italian opera company. They performed everything in Italian, including operas like Carmen and Lohengrin that were written in languages other than Italian. 
Um, that wasn't very successful, so the next year they hired a German opera company and they performed everything in German, including Italian operas. Uh, but that was much more successful. The Met seats 3,800. Uh, the stage is more than 100 feet deep. It has seven performances a week of different operas. There's two different operas on stage every day. During the week, there'll be one being rehearsed and a different one being performed that night. On Saturdays, there's two different performances. So the stage operates 24 hours a day. When the opera ends at midnight or whatever, the night crew comes in to remove that opera, start building the next day's opera. Opera gets rehearsed at 10.30 in the morning, 2.30 that Rehearsal is over, between 2.30 and 4 anyway. New opera goes on for what's going to be on that night. The annual budget, according to that Times article this past Sunday, is $330 million. Also, according to that Times article, the payroll is 3,400 people, including both part-time and full-time positions in 14 different unions. They've had in-house media technology. They started doing archival recordings, as I showed you, in 1900. Um, the first electronic hearing aid was demonstrated at the Met in 1903. They wired 25 seats for it. In 1908, they had a stage surveillance microphone. 1966, when the new Met was opened, they had conductor and latecomer microphones. Uh, 1995, optically filtered seat back titles, so you can't see the title screen on the seat next to you. And uh, 2006, high definition for latecomers. Uh, by the way, the conductor monitors, you can see some in the upper right. Um, that's for the singers, so if they're doing a love duet, they don't have to keep looking at where the conductor is. They can look at whoever they're singing to. Um, scenic real-time interactive computer graphics. They use infrared sensors to indicate where people are, microphones, rotational encoders. So here you see a scene from Damnation of Faust at the right. There's a gondola, and you can see the gondola is making ripples in the water as it goes across the stage, except there's no water. That's all interactive live computer graphics. Uh, ultra high definition, and whatever is happening on stage is uh, going through processors and servers to go on there. The processing includes depth selection and video warping, so I'll show you in a moment. This was something called the machine that was put in for the ring cycle at the Met, 24 rotating planks. Well, they would project on them, but as the planks are rotating, the projection would get too big as the plank went far or get too small as it got close. So the video is being warped according to what's happening in the rotation of the planks, plus they're choosing depth planes based on where the plank is. So when this thing rotates, it looks like there's this gigantic root structure rotating on stage. For media going out of the house, here's the Met's first TV in a studio in 1940. Uh, Pagliacci, and the first live TV from the Opera House, Otello, that was shot off screen off of ABC. Martin Mayer, who wrote the book Television, talked about watching Met opening nights in a bar. They had TV intentions in 1966, so they wired the Opera House with these multi-core camera cables. Uh, some of you old-timers may be familiar with TV81. The Met was wired with TV82. The cable was never used, to the best of my knowledge, and I've asked old-timers at the Met, they say it was never used. So here we are in 2007, stringing our own fiber optic cables where they need to go, rather than using the in-house wiring. The modern Met TV era, which I uh, date from when I showed up, in 1973, uh, we did the first low-light level video experiments. The first live from the Met show was in 1977. People talk about how Downton Abbey has the highest ratings on PBS. Uh-uh. Um, the live from the Met show had an eight rating unheard of on PBS, and 18 million people saw the first show live. Our hosts have included Big Bird, uh, Jiang Zi, uh, if you remember Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, F. Murray Abraham, Mikhail Baryshnikov, Kristen Chenoweth, uh, Katie Couric, Rudy Giuliani, Tony Randall, Garrick Utley, Joanne Woodward, and many others. For the Mets Centennial in 1983, we transmitted 14 hours live around the world. The first Met HD telecast was in 1990, the first home pay-per-view in 1991, the first plaza cast in 2001, and on home video, not just VHS and DVD, but also VHD, which is a strange 
format that existed only in Japan, and LaserDisc. The Met on TV, 174 performances transmitted to date. It's been broadcast longer than Meet the Press, which is supposedly the oldest show on television, more primetime hours than the Simpsons, the Simpsons, which supposedly has the most primetime hours of anything, and it has achieved higher ratings than Leno and Letterman combined. So in 2005 to 6, we were doing one live radio opera broadcast a week for 21 weeks. By the way, when I use this we, um, I'm a freelancer at the Met, but I've been a freelancer at the Met since 1973, so I'll fall into the we mode. But anything I say is just me, it's not official Met stuff. And one HD show, which that year happened not to be live. 2006, we continue doing those. We add four live satellite operas per week for 33 weeks add streaming, add opening night plaza cast and Times Square cast. Now notice the plaza cast picture here, it's daylight. So how are we going to project on a screen in daylight? 100,000 lumens of projection, four 25,000 lumen projectors. And we did six global HD cinema casts. This year we're now up to 12. We then would do encores of the cinema casts, re-edit for PBS television, uh, changed all the house stuff to HD and introduced an in internet streaming and download service called MetPlayer. This is the Met's Watch and Listen page. To live big. Tickets on sale now. So the watch and listen page tells you about the live HD in the movie theaters, tells you about Met Player, uh, downloading stuff from Rhapsody, free audio stream on real networks, great performances at the Met on PBS, the Saturday matinee broadcasts, and the uh, satellite channel on Sirius XM. How do you get to Times Square? Satellite, fiber, twin axe, coax, microwave, and negotiations with three networks, several buildings, and the city. And every one of those screens in Times Square has a different latency, so we have to delay everything so they're all in sync, and then we have to make sure our audio is in sync for the viewing areas. One viewing area on uh, 43rd Street heading back to 44th, and then another viewing area on those steps above the tickets on uh, 46th to 47th Street. We've been on 15 of the screens so far. Our goal is to be on all of them. Now here's another shot of that 1952 transmission. Anyone have any idea what's happening in that theater that night? Looks to me like might be Carmen. Okay, here's our current movie listings. At least we got uh, billing above Alpha Dog, which was nice. So here's... Um, 55-year progress of the cinema casts. I did this in 2007, between 1952 and 2007. In 1952, black and white, low definition, worse than AM quality sound, and so on, as I mentioned before. Now, color, high def, subtitles, digital surround, 15 cameras moving, satellite delivery. This is, in, 19, in 2007, 600 screens, now more than 2,000 screens, and so on. But for both of them, there were house union and box office concerns. Oh, if you do this, it's going to destroy the opera house. Um, in both of them, the cinema audience applauds, applauded, and in both of them, the quality perception was high because of that mass audience and buying a ticket. So there's, again, community media versus home media, which is why we edit differently for PBS. We put in more close-ups. If we do stuff for personal devices, we put in even more close-ups. Challenges of the HD cinema cast. Now, we've always had a problem. The stage runs 24 hours, two different operas per day, late final dress, uh, production in front of a live audience with low light levels and high contrast. All the ones with the asterisks are new problems. How do we coordinate cinema versus home theater and TV experiences? We have to deal with robotic tracks, towers, and uh, remote cameras, coordinate radio and TV, sometimes sharing, multi-language live subtitling, complex live intermissions, uh, multiple opera shows being prepared simultaneously. Sometimes we'll have one cinema cast one Saturday and then with a different director the next Saturday. 
uh, distribution with differing display and sound standards in every cinema, multiple live feeds and rapid turnaround, editing for the encores in PBS, and educational materials. Now, this slide has nothing whatsoever to do with any form of media. I just show it as an example of how tight the scheduling is at the Met. There is no time to focus the lights on the set. So at the final technical rehearsal, they lower the asbestos curtain, they project a grid on it, note where every light is on that grid, and then while they're changing sets, they focus the lights on the grid. Because there's just no time to focus the lights by the time the set is built. So here's two TV days with five different operas on the stage. Thursday night, Andrea Chenier performance, a live satellite broadcast. Friday daytime, there's a tour and dot rehearsal with orchestra. There's a backstage tour. TV loads in and sets up, but we can't put our cameras into position yet because there's going to be a different opera that night, Friday night, the Egyptish Helena, which has a performance. Saturday morning, we come in. Our mics and cameras can first get into position after the sets have been built. We don't get any meal break, really. Uh, we do the Barbara Seville performance. There's a live radio broadcast. There's a live cinema broadcast. Then everything we have has to come out because that night there's a different opera, La Traviata. And PBS broadcasts the first emperor, and so we have to coordinate that also. The settings and times of Tosca I told you about. Here's the settings and times of the Met. The Met is located in Lincoln Center, which has 26 performance venues, 26,243 audience at once possible. It's the number one radio TV market. There's wireless mics and comms in all of those theaters. Where we put our trucks is US Highway number one. There's 24-hour stage operations. And live means not being able to say, I'm sorry. Uh, neither snow nor rain nor head of state visit nor construction nor even fashion week. Here's fashion week. This was during uh, one of our recent transmissions. I think it was Francesca. And they decide to remove their cooling system while we're on the air with a satellite um, system that's aimed right through where that crane is. So we caution them that they're about to fry themselves and they agreed not to remove the cooling system at that moment. So because we don't get more than one rehearsal, we have camera conferences. We record all of the cameras individually uh, in high def. Um, we have a system that the director can use to call up any one of the shots and say, oh, okay, it looks like camera four can get that, so we'll work on that. You see the 12 in there indicates camera 12 is on the air at the moment. One of our directors also likes to have a shot of the conductor so the score reader can read stuff. So here's uh, progression. Here's 1954 TV from the Opera House. If you didn't happen to notice the camera in the orchestra pit, fortunately the camera operator is wearing a white shirt. Here's 1968. A uh, little bit of interference with the audience. Those are TK41 cameras. This was the first one that they called stage lighting, which meant they turned on every light in the house, and it was considered barely sufficient for the cameras. Here we are in 2007, not interfering with the audience. You can see one of our cameras there along the orchestra pit rail, but the height of that camera was chosen specifically so it will not bother people in any one of the seats. We can have people seating on either side. There's a special mount that you'll see in a moment. Here's the extremes of stage lighting contrast. This was actually shot on film. This is not video. So at the top, we have the star, maybe a little bit overexposed, but she's possibly properly exposed. Uh, below that, we've increased the iris. She's now totally burnt out, but you can see some of the other singers. We then increase the iris some more. You can see a little bit of the set, and the singers are burned out now. And under the work lights on the right, you can see what the set looks like. So tremendous amount of contrast. So in 1973, we came in and started working on the low light levels. The camera at the top in the center is a CEI 270 camera with secondary electron conduction tubes that were developed by the US Air Force for seeing black cats in forests at night. Uh, at the right, the little camera is a PCP90 LLL from Philips Labs. The LLL means low light level. It had two stage image intensifiers in front of each tube. And then the other cameras are Fernsey uh, KCUs, which were the first cameras to have bias light. 
to reduce the problems of image lag. We were using the longest range zoom lens of the time, which was a 15 to 1. We're now up to uh, 99 to 1. We think that's better than the 101 to 1s. Um, so we went out with a light meter. So, oh, what's the light level here? The meter, meter didn't move. The needle just stayed there at zero. Um, extreme contrast, I mentioned before, so we developed a contrast compressor with that same person I showed you before, Tom Stockham, the guy who worked on the first digital recording and the Watergate tapes. You can see more detail in the woman's dress on the right, even though the exposure is the same on both of those. Visual sizes and why we have issues with that. Uh, the movie theater screen is the outer rectangle. Uh, framing and cutting are different, so that close-up that I'm showing would be too tight for cinema, but the wide shot is too tight to linger on for TV. Why the Met Mix is stereo, this is the radio booth. To the left of the left picture is the women's room. Uh, and Sorry, to the left of the left picture is the men's room, and to the right of the right picture is the women's room, uh, which is why we can't go any more in that direction, and in front is the aisle of the Grand Tier. So it's a very narrow space, not suitable for doing a surround mix. So we do an up mix in the truck uh, to surround. We listen to the parameters in a mixing theater, and then we go back into theaters periodically to make sure that the uh, mix is good. We um, record the production mix in the truck, but the music mix comes from inside the house. Surround, again, completely different for cinema and home. In a cinema, every speaker you can see, even the ones on either side of the screen, are surround speakers, because the main speakers are behind the screen. But at home, the surround speakers are only behind you. And then we have lip sync issues. You might be in a big cinema, and if you're 50 feet away from the screen, you're seeing stuff a frame late. Uh, not a problem if it's a wide shot, but if we get to a tight close-up, then people sometimes call and say, the lip sync just went out. Well, the people in the front row aren't complaining that the lip sync gets out because it isn't, but the people in the back row are, and I'll explain that in a moment. Here's the Metropolitan Opera House. I mentioned that the stage is more than 100 feet deep, and the house itself is pretty deep to the farthest seats, so you can have seven frames of acoustic delay in the Opera House. But that's not a problem, as I'll explain in a moment. Here's how we create the surround sound, the up mix we do on a uh, Dolby 564. Um, for the encores, the first season, we had to create an LTRT stereo. For PBS, we take a vocal submix, an orchestra submix, an ambience, and create a true 5.1, and then that goes out as Dolby E. But here's uh, the sound issue on the right. If you see a little tiny head, you expect the sound to be late. You've learned over the years that sound coming from a distant source takes a long time to get to you. But if you see that giant close-up, then you expect to be the, sound on t uh, the sound to be bang on time. By the way, we go to these 2,000 movie theaters. The projectionist doesn't have very much time to look in on anything. So what do we use for lip sync testing? A clapboard. And we do five minutes of clapboard, five minutes of opera, five minutes of clapboard, five minutes of opera, and continue that for the two-hour test period. Uh, the network doesn't exist until two hours before we start it, so that's why we have to test each time. There's also perspective issues visually. There's also a vertical angular perspective, which is kind of interesting. In a movie theater, an old-style movie theater, everyone's looking up at the screen. In a modern stadium seating movie theater, some people might be looking straight ahead, but no one's really looking down at the screen. So at the Met, all of our cameras are looking straight ahead or shooting up. Uh, but at other opera houses, they have cameras that are up high and shooting down, like at La Scala or San Francisco or something. And I went to one of their transmissions at a theater that had a balcony and watched the first act from the orchestra level and didn't feel good about it and went up to the balcony for the other. I said, oh, that works much better. So this vertical angular perspective is kind of important. Here's something from the Scotsman. I would not make this statement, but they did. State-of-the-art cameras, undetectable to those actually watching in the Met itself. I think they're kind of detectable these days. But here's a camera plot, so I'll show you um, where some of the cameras are and stuff that we've done. So down near the front, we have uh, three robotic cameras. Um, this is a robotic sled. Um, you're seeing it there with a, um, 
a Sony camera that is disconnected, so that's just the optical block. The electronics is lying on its side. We've since changed to a uh, P1 camera, which takes up about as much room. You see the supports for the track in the next image on the top center. They don't get built until the morning when we're putting in the track. Uh, then the track gets laid down on top of that. Then we put on the track. Then we put the camera on it. Then we had these uh, super towers that can extend 24 feet. And we put them in the corner of the orchestra pit. There you see one down at the bottom. Uh, very difficult to adjust once it's in position. Weighs 800 pounds, by the way. So very difficult to get up the stairs and into the orchestra pit and into position. Here is a mount that we had made. We call it a Volkswagen because it's very small. Uh, again, the height is calculated precisely to not bother the people in the seats. There's a little seat for the camera person. It's on wheels so that it can be rolled down the aisle to get into position because we don't have time to build the cameras in position. And then it's being locked into place. This is cameras in the back of the house. No big deal with blocking any seats because they're all the way in the back of the house. But still, the same problem, getting them into position. We don't have the time to put in a tripod and build the camera in position. So we put them on LMAX spider dollies, which are narrow enough that they can be rolled into the aisle without taking out any seats. And the reason we can't take out any seats is because in two hours after we're done, there's going to be another opera. So then we had this new production of Barber of Seville, which had a little boardwalk around the orchestra pit called a passerelle. And people were singing and dancing on this little boardwalk. So we did computer modeling of what the cameras were going to look like. Now, obviously, this passerelle is blocking our two main camera positions at the bottom of the aisles. So we had to change those to robotic cameras and put long lenses on them. Um, put the tower cameras outside of the passerelle. And then we had this impossibility. We're doing a rehearsal of Barbara Seville as a matinee on Saturday. Uh, sorry, a, as a, an evening performance on Saturday. The matinee performance was supposed to end at 5, didn't end until 5.35. Then the musicians in the audience leave. Then the passerelle gets built over the orchestra pit, has to get built strong enough so that 20 performers can be on there singing and dancing. Then after it's built, we can first build the pit track mounts and the pit edge mounts. The towers, the 800 pound towers, can go into position after that. Then the remote mounts get built. Then the cameras and the lenses get installed. Then the musicians enter the pit and start tuning. The house opens at 7.30, so we've got less than two hours. They were originally also going to have a super techno crane on stage. Um, did we make it? We knocked over a harp, but it wasn't hurt. So the performance begins at 8 p.m. with the robo track, the two super towers, the two mini moats, and 11 other cameras that we have to deal with also in the same two hour period. Coordinating live TV, uh, live radio and cinema. Radio has three different feeds of its own that go out. There's a U.S. commercial feed, a U.S. non-commercial feed, and a non-U.S. feed, and they get different material. Sometimes cinema and radio would share an announcer. Sometimes cinema and radio would share interviews. Sometimes not. So the stage manager's talking constantly. I have 10 seconds left on the tape. How's your opera quiz coming? Uh, and so on. The stage microphones, this is looking down on the stage. Um, there are four pairs of microphones. Each pair has a shotgun and a cardioid. Uh, and that's it, with augmentation in sets or light bridges as necessary. But basically, we're picking up an ambient sound. And again, if somebody's 100 feet upstage, we have those two frames of acoustic delay. If the director is taking a close-up of that person, we've got a problem. Uh, almost no body mics. This is my favorite t-shirt for opera. Real singers don't need microphones. Unfortunately, TV shows do. Uh, the one exception, significant exception, Dr. Atomic, uh, the composer, John Adams, wrote body microphones into the score. So, of course, we use body microphones for that. Now, why don't we use the body microphones? Uh, in part, it's a perception thing. There are people who think there is sound reinforcement at the Met. There is none, even though it's a 3,800-seat theater. Those singers are belting out to the last seat. We don't want anyone to think, if they see a body mic, oh, they're singing through sound reinforcement. 
Here's video control. The guy with the white hair in the front, that's Matty Randazzo. He's been doing video at the Met since 1968, that uh, Japanese production that I showed you. Here's the production control room. And sometimes we'll have live interviews in the production control room while the show is going out live. Uh, we have separate graphics and subtitling and then a separate intermission control room because the intermission director might be setting up shots while the opera is going on. So we obviously can't have that be the same director. Here's a walk-in carousel. We have to, as in the movie theaters, provide something to entertain you while you're waiting. So we promote upcoming operas. We talk about the cast that's in the current opera. And then this one, notice that there's a little white line underneath him, so this slide wasn't made properly. Why wasn't the slide made properly? Because he found out this morning that he's going to be singing in the opera. We found out not much uh, later than that that he was going to do that. Quick, make a slide, quick, stick it in the carousel while it's being transmitted. Um, let's get this stuff out there. We do a countdown. Now we have a problem in the US primarily, you're familiar with digital cinema, but digital cinema projectors cost a lot of money. And the exhibitors don't want to buy them because that would cost them a lot of money. So there are companies that will put in the digital cinema projector at no cost to the exhibitor, but they will uh, charge a portion of the box office, it's called a virtual print fee, until they've paid off the projector. Well, the theaters don't want to use that for the Met because if they do that, then they have to pay the virtual print fee. So instead, they use the pre-show projector, the thing that shows the ads to the audience. Now, what do you see in the left picture here besides the McDonald's ad? Do you notice anything else that happens to be lit up? The seats. You can see the seats because the lights are on during the ads. So they run the pre-show projectors very hot, very high pedestal, so that they'll be bright enough while the lights are on. So this Macbeth chart that was sent to me by a viewer was, hey, you know, you're not looking right because there's too much pedestal on this stuff. Do something about it. Well, we try. We talk to the distributors. We have the opposite problem with the sound. They want you to keep talking to your neighbor before the movie starts. So they do the ads at 75 dB SPL. When the movie starts, at it, it's at 85 dB SPL. But we need to be at 85 dB SPL. We also have a sold out theater problem. We were in one theater where they had the projector in a 200 seat theater. They sold it out right away. They said, ooh, we'll move it into the 500 seat theater. But when they moved the same projector into the 500 seat theater, it was a quarter of the brightness. We also had one theater that had us in one auditorium and they sold that out right away. So they said, oh, we'll put it in a second auditorium. They put it in the second auditorium and they called up and said, we're not getting any pictures in the second auditorium. Oh, okay. Um, what kind of connection are you using? Connection? So here's the live feeds in 2007, the various countries that we were going to, the various satellites that we were on, uh, the various fiber networks, uplinks in various places. Um, this is our northernmost theater. It's in Tromsø, Norway. It's 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle, the oldest continuously operated movie theater in Norway. Uh, that's what it looked like at noon downtown. The opera started at 7.30 p.m., very um, low elevation angle. Here's some cinemas and problems that we have. Uh, the largest auditorium that we're in, by the way, is Auditorio Nacional in Mexico City, which seats 10,000 people. That's considerably more than the Met. Um, we have the additional auditorium problem, as I mentioned. There's connections, weather, snow, uh, tuning and languages. We transmit multiple languages, so for the uh, walk-in period, we transmit a little uh, bit of the language down at the bottom so the projectionist can just look out the window quickly and see whether, okay, it's English or Deutsch or Portuguese or Italiano or something like that. Uh, sun outage issues for some reason. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm just curious, is there a technician who goes around to the auditoriums to calibrate screens and sound? Uh, question is, is there a technician who goes around to the auditoriums to calibrate screens and so on? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. 
uh, not because we don't want to do it, but because the distributors won't let us. Um, when we get a new exhibitor, um, when Dubai came online, I went to Dubai and I worked out their issues. Um, when Yale University came on, we went up to Yale and we worked with them on that. But for the basic distribution in the United States, until we're on the digital cinema projectors and we're the same as a movie, it's going to be a bit of a problem. Mark, are you not on DCI compliant projectors here? We are, for the most part in the United States, not on DCI compliant projectors. There's more every year, but um, not in the United States. Elsewhere, Canada, we're on DCI projectors. Europe, we're on DCI projectors. It's wonderful. Why can't that be Uh, the question is, why can't that be a condition of offering the Met in HD? I would love to do that. The contract that the Met's distributor signed doesn't allow us to do that. So we complain when we can, and we get stuff improved somewhat. Now, this is the last 10 minutes of every transmission, a white card. Why do we transmit a white card for the last 10 minutes? Because the projectionist in the multiplex is busy. He doesn't know when the opera is over. So the auditorium is dark. How do the people get out? We provide the exit lighting. This was plan A when we were just going to 60 uh, movie theaters or so. We would start from the Met, go up by satellite, uh, come down to the U.S. theaters, which were National Cinemedia, the NCM, come down in Toronto, turn around, go up on a Canadian satellite, come down to the Cineplex uh, movie theaters in Canada come down in Atlanta at Vizvix, go up on a transatlantic satellite, come down at Arkiva in Winchester, go up on a European satellite, come down in the UK, uh, come down outside of Stockholm at SES, go back up to the satellite on a Nordic beam, come down in Tromsø, Norway. So I insisted on having a test a couple of months before. We start the test. Trumsa calls up uh, two minutes into the test. Yeah, yeah, everything is fine. We're getting the pictures. We're getting the sound. The subtitles are good. Thank you very much. Nobody else was getting anything. Last link in the chain was fine. Nobody else getting anything for all kinds of reasons that I've shown on the slide. So we eventually worked out all the problems and got everybody to get stuff. So this was by the end of the first season uh, we were already that complicated. Um, I can't even show you what the current system is like. It's just too much stuff. For educational outreach, we create an educator's guide for every one of the operas. There are rehearsal invitations for schools, uh, school installations, educational materials. But some of this stuff gets shot when we're doing our lighting test. Now, when we're doing our lighting test, we want bad things to look bad but they're shooting the promotional materials at the same time, so we have to make stuff look good. So a problem, we uh, will get somebody say, okay, we need this for press, we'll suddenly make everything look good, we record that aria, then we go back to things looking bad. Is it worth it? We've come in as high as ninth in U.S. weekend theatrical box office gross. That's for one transmission of an opera versus continuous showings of movies. Theaters keep getting added, uh, people asked to join the network, it's increased attendance at the Met, it has increased attendance at other companies, the Cinemacast promote the PBS broadcasts, um, and then the various praise that we've had, some more Met media for the masses, um, the helicopter is in there just because one of our directors wanted us to do a helicopter shot from Times Square. Um, the things that I've shown in uh, gold here, Antarctica and high frame rate. We're talking about going to the South Pole, but no geostationary satellite can get to the South Pole. And there are polar satellites, but the polar satellites don't have capacity. So the only satellites we can use are bad satellites, geostationary satellites that have fallen out of proper orbital position, so they move north and south. When they fall below 8.5 degrees south latitude, they're visible at the South Pole but then we have to change from satellite to satellite to satellite, so at the moment just Hubani base on the Antarctic Peninsula. Talking about higher frame rates because on a big screen it's an issue. And uh, my special thanks to those without whom I shudder to think, the Met, the world's best freelance crew, 
headed by Tom Holmes for audio and Ron Washburn for video, All Mobile Video, which provides our facilities and occupies every legal parking space on three city blocks. And I will be happy to take any questions. David. What is the signal that's actually sent up on the satellite? It's MPEG-2 um, going to Europe and Latin America at 16 megabits, uh, going to the U.S. it's about 19 megabits. Um, the reason that it's MPEG-2 is I mentioned everything stays in the compressed domain. We compress at the Met, we decompress at the cinema. When it's MPEG-2, we can extract the subtitles and put them into the video without decompressing, uh, but we can't do that in MPEG-4 or any um, higher efficiency format. But because there's only one compressed, decompressed stage, 16 megabits is fine. We, we go to a theater in Eindhoven, uh, Holland, which is where Philips Laboratories is, and the engineers from Philips Laboratories go in each time and expect to see compression artifacts and report that they see none. Yes? Has there been any experimentation with larger single sensor cameras? The uh, question is, has there been any experimentation with larger single sensor cameras? Um, the answer is no for the live feed. Uh, for some of our intermission material, we have shot on large format cameras. The problem with the live feed is no one has a switcher that can handle it. We don't have the uh, camera control that's available. Sony has various levels of what's called hypergamma that we'll use in various situations. That's not available on the single sensor cameras. Um, we have been in communication with NHK about doing an 8K super high vision with one camera in a sweet spot and projecting that proscenium wide and having people bring their own binoculars to see stuff. Actually, when yes. I followed that up, um, I saw Farcival last week. Uh -huh. And man, could you tell the difference between the cameras used in the Opera House and the interstitial pieces uh -huh. for the people they're interviewed? Uh, well, lighting, actually, those were the same cameras. The lighting, the blacks were utterly crushed, badly uh -huh. crushed inside the Opera House so much so that the person I was with is not a technical person really commented on it and she was absolutely right. Well, my well, suspicion well, is that suggest... what's happening there is the uh, projector in the theater. I'm sure that's true. Because there was no crushing of the blacks no. in Parsifal that I saw in the TV truck. It was horrendous and I was going to follow that up with a question of whether anyone has been tracking which theaters are better theaters and have DCI compliant. Yeah, we encourage people to complain to us uh, so that we can get stuff to happen. Uh, the DCI, that's a luck of the draw thing. NCM is very slowly changing to DCI. But um, other complaints, we've had people, I showed you the guy who sent in the Macbeth chart. We had that theater get fixed up. I went to the Empire 25. They had problems. We got that fixed up. So do complain, and we can. But more than that, the single sensor cameras at Marcus thinking of the yep. F5 from Sony, any of the Canon cameras, the C300. Well, those tell me how we're going to use a 99 to 1 lens on an F5. Point well taken. They're I can't on. put the cameras on stage. I can't get a close-up by having the camera operator walk up to the person who's singing 100 feet up stage. So I've got to use a tight zoom lens. What tight zoom lens can I put on an F5? There could possibly be a mix. I'm not sure what to do, but I... I How do I do the I mix so. in a live production yeah. where I'm going into a live switcher? What was the low light levels is one of the issues? The, the light levels are down to a fraction of a foot candle, uh, in part because a lot of the scenic designs now are projection. So we can't raise the lighting to wipe out the projection that's part of the scenic design. And then the lighting designer will frequently do something, oh, okay, I want this person to disappear into the dark. But if the television director doesn't want that person to disappear into the dark, then we're shooting that person. Yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if my perception is right or not, but I, the last two years I've been recording off of the internet. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the balances are very different from what I used to get, that the singers 
the voices seem to be much stronger than the orchestra. Is that my misperception? Are you doing something different in terms of the, the microphones? We're not. Um, it's still the same four pairs of microphones across the lip. Uh, it's still the same audio producer, J. David Sachs. So he's hearing in the radio booth what he wants it to be, and he's been the audio producer for about 30 years now. Because it's that, I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a difference. I mean, I can, I can hear it. Sometimes I don't, I don't hear the orchestra as prominently as I do the voices. The voices just kind of blast out. I don't know if it's my own equipment or the, the tone recording that I'm using to kind of record things. Or if there's a phase reversal someplace, um, no, that would work in the other direction. Hmm. No, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes? Um, what, uh, how close is the relationship between the stage director and the, the TV director, the film director? It varies. Um, in one case, it was as close as possible, and that was when we did um, Nixon in China. The stage director was Peter Sellers. The television director was Peter Sellers. So we couldn't get any closer than that. Um, in other cases, it's kind of really up to the stage director how much he wants to be involved. Um, some stage directors will sit with the television director and will say, well, you know, this is what I want. And the television director will say, well, you know, how about this? And they'll work on some kind of compromise. But there are other cases we have one uh, director who, a stage director who once the opera opens, as far as he's concerned, he's done. And he leaves and he gives it to the house assistant directors to make it run. And so we have no input from that person. And what was the high frame rate that you were using? Uh, not yet, but currently we're um, 59.94i uh, in um, the US and Canada, and we are 25 overseas. 25, so? Well, 50. But we are interested because one of the, the big issues I find is the larger the screen, the more the frame rate is noticeable. And I'd love to go to a higher frame rate. I'd much rather go to a higher frame rate than go to 4K. Without, without, just as a footnote, uh -huh. because we're not watching, well, a lot of stagecraft is fairly static. Uh -huh compared to motion pictures. I'm not sure if high frame rate is as, is as significant oh, as yeah. tonal scale reproduction. Yeah. Because when you can't see into an image, and I work Well, with tonal scale camera. reproduction, we cannot do better than we're doing now. I think you can, and that's what I'm suggesting. I, I disagree. You could, put a, you could put a prime long lens on a long camera and, and get something with... Eyes. We are not limited by our cameras. We've gone to... Um, 2,500 cameras so that we could get two more stops of sensitivity. We have lighting meetings where we can discuss with the lighting people increasing the level. And we have someone who shall remain nameless who is saying, no, that looks too bright. So we are not limited by what we are sending out. You may have a projector that's having a problem in a cinema. That's certainly possible. But what is being sent out is being limited by what the people who are in charge want to have sent out. We're using every available tool, including Hyper Gamma 3 that came out on the 2500s to make the grayscale as wonderful as it possibly can. But regardless of what the set is doing, if we have a camera that's panning from one side of the stage to the other, we've got a lot of motion. And that's where the higher frame rate will come in handy. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. One oh. non-technical question. Sure. How much of your time is devoted to the Met Opera? Um, I'd say it's about four days per opera that we send out, and then maybe a, two or three other days that we just work out issues. Like today, we had a meeting about archiving. So we're doing 12 operas this season, so call it 50 days. Mark, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.